Okay, so we just looked at how energy is transmitted and passed along through an ecosystem and how there are some inefficiencies built into it. But energy isn't the only component that's going to flow through an ecosystem. Various chemicals, many of which are essential for life, are also going to pass through. And because essential chemicals, just like you saw back in Bio 101 with essential vitamins and minerals, cannot be made by the body. They have to be consumed. And so we're going to have a recycling of these molecules from both formerly living or now dead organisms, as well as from the non-living components of the ecosystem. So for these chemical reservoirs, each chemical is going to be stored initially in some non-living part of the environment, within the atmosphere, within the rocks, within dirt prior to its becoming soil, or even within soil once it has organic com uh, content within it. Organisms are going to require chemicals from one of these or from all of these reservoirs. Chemicals can be cycled through a f food chain as an organism consumes some of these chemicals from the chemical reservoir and then dies and be decomposes, the decomposer, decomposers and detritivores are going to return those nutrients back into the soil so that they can once again be taken up by plants and be consumed by animals or be taken by animals directly. And eventually the chemicals are going to be returned once again. So the three main chemicals that we're going to be looking at that are going to cycle through the ecosystem is carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. So the carbon cycle is probably the one with which you're most familiar. And plants are going to be a primary recycler of carbon. Plants are going to use carbon molecules because, of course, they fix the carbon, the carbon from the carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere into their bodies and into their energy stores when they perform photosynthesis. Then as animals consume plants and then other animals consume their herbivores, carbon moves through the cycle. And eventually, when these organisms die, they will accumulate in the sediment until detritivores break them down, but if detritivores and decomposers do not break them down, then they become fixed in the earth. They become fossil fuels. They become things like coal, oil, natural gas. And for hundreds of millions of years prior to humans, these fossil fuels had been taken out of the atmosphere because the oxygen, the carbon dioxide the, sorry, the carbon was trapped in those fossil fuels. Of course, now that humans are burning tremendous numbers of fossil fuels, we are vastly increasing the amount of carbon and carbon dioxide that is available. And it's, well, obviously presenting some issues. So why are the global carbon dioxide levels rising? And specifically, why is it that we see this oscillation? So unequivocally, 97 or probably even more percent of scientists concur that carbon dioxide is rising. It's, it's not a debate. It's not a question that is the fact of what is happening. But we sometimes get trapped by the episodic rises and falls on an annual basis. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense that carbon dioxide levels will change throughout a year. Generally, when we have seasons, plants will have leaves and will be performing photosynthesis for part of the year. And in any part of the world that has sufficient seasonality that the plants drop their leaves, they will then drop their leaves and perform significantly less carbon dioxide at those times. And so generally when the plants have leaves and are performing photosynthesis, they are removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere at a greater rate. And when they lose their leaves, well, they don't. And what you see here is over the last thousand years, 
the temperature as a proxy by the amount of carbon dioxide that has been present in the atmosphere. And what you can see is in the last 120 years or so, we've had a very sharp increase in the amount of carbon dioxide. And of course, that is attributed to human burning of fossil fuels. Now, moving on to the nitrogen cycle, <clears throat> excuse me, what we're going to see is that nitrogen is generally present in the dirt prior to its becoming soil, and it arises in the dirt from nitrogen in the atmosphere as it gets bioturbated, as it gets moved into the soil from things like worms moving the air around. Nitrogen makes up approximately 70% of all of the gas in the, the atmosphere. Well, how does it then get from the atmosphere into pore spaces in the soil to become something that is usable by plants and then by animals? Well, there are bacteria, specifically denitrifying bacteria, that can take the nitrogen that was present in the soil and fix it. It can turn it into these nitrates. Plants are then able to assimilate the nitrates or to take them up, absorb them into their roots. <clears throat> some plants do that better than others. For some plants, they need the bacteria or the decomposers to have broken it down so that they can take it directly from the soil. And for other plants, like many of the legumes or the bean plants, they actually have nitrogen-fixing bacteria symbiotically living within their roots, and they form these big nodules in the roots. And the bacteria-plant combination then is able to fix the nitrogen in a way that the plant can take it up and use it. And then when animals consume the plants, they get the nitrogen. And when the animals or the plants die, the nitrogen gets returned back into the soil. And nitrogen is frequently one of the bottlenecks. It's what will limit plant growth. If there is insufficient nitrogen, the plants will not be able to grow. And this is in part why we have to use fertilizers or why we have to supplement with nitrogen. And again, there are some plants, things like corn, that are not particularly good, things like cotton, that are not particularly good at fixing nitrogen. They need to have readily accessible nitrogen or farmers who are planting very large quantities of these crops will need to practice what's called crop rotation. They'll need to alternate in growing seasons or at least alternate every few years between high nitrogen usage and highly nitrogen efficient plant fixers. And phosphorus is the last of these cycles. Plants can absorb phosphorus through their roots as phosphates, so they'll be, the phosphorus will be bonded with oxygen, and then the phosphates can move through the food chain. <clears throat> and this is an extremely important part of the essential components of a diet for animals because they are going to use the phosphates for ATP, right? Adenosine triphosphate, that's a, an essential part of the energy usage and storage, as well as a very important part of that uh, backbone of the DNA. So phosphates will be taken in from soil and they will be returned from the soil when either plant or animal materials are broken down. And so carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus all cycle through the ecosystem, through the food chain. Eutrophication is what can happen if there is a tremendous surge in the amount of nutrients. So too little nutrients is bad, but too much is also bad. And so if we have large amounts of nitrogen and phosphorus that are generally added to fertilizers, and then the fertilizers run off and end up in a lake or in a river, they can lead to rapid growth of bacteria and algae in these watery ecosystems. And what will happen is that it leads to an overconsumption of oxygen 
and you tend to get these massive, massive die-offs. Pretty much the lake becomes stagnant and unable to support life because of this huge surge in the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus. So once again, take a moment to read the question, pause the video, and when you're ready, move it on to see the answer. And hopefully you realize that there are two ways, both by cellular, as a product of cellular respiration, which of course has carbon dioxide as a byproduct, and from burning fossil fuels. Same thing, pause it, and when you're ready, advance to the, neck, to the answer. And once again, hopefully you realize it was number two, where nitrogen and phosphorus would need to be fixed, whereas they can take carbon directly, they have to have some help and support to, for, to take nitrogen and phosphorus up through their roots. And many of these communities, these ecosystems or biomes are going to change over time, especially after a, some form of natural disaster. So we're going to look at the idea of ecological succession. <clears throat> Whenever we have life beginning to move into a region of lifelessness, you'll begin with pretty much just rocks, exposed rocks at the surface with nothing living on them. And the primary succession is going to then begin with first organisms that are able to colonize and live in very marginal environments, things like lichens that will grow directly on the rocks. They then begin to break down the rocks chemically and make them accessible to slightly more advanced forms of life that are going to begin the secondary succession, things like mosses and grasses. You'll sometimes actually see these mosses, grasses, or even small shrubs beginning to grow on rocky ledges. This is going to bring us into the intermediate community that has a greater variety. It's not just lichens, but grasses, herbs, shrubs, and possibly even young forest plants. And then we get to a climax community, and this might take decades, if not centuries, to form. But then we get more mature forests, things like oaks and hickories. And finally, we get beeches, sugar maples, and the hardwoods. And these are going to be the climax community or climax forest. These are longer living species that are better able to provide stability and a self-sustaining community that usually will have a very diverse and abundant fauna as well as flora. And so an example of secondary succession, pause it, and when you're ready, advance. And so plowing the field and letting it fallow would be secondary succession. If you had a glacier regressing or a volcanic eruption, those would take us back to a need for primary succession all over again. Essentially, it would bring us back to a time of lifelessness. And some species within a community are going to outweigh others. They might not be very abundant. There might not be large numbers of them. But those small numbers fill a vital role and keep everything else in check. And their absence really destroys the community. So an example of these are keystone species, such as the starfish. Starfish, even though it might not look like it, are voracious predators. They will eat anything. And in tidal pools, they often do. They eat everything that is stuck in the tidal pool for the duration of the low tide when everything is stranded. And by their ability to do this, they will keep mussel populations in check. If the keystone species, if those starfish are removed, pretty much the ecosystem falls apart and mussels will take over. And there are a series of keystone species in different areas, and so you see the list of them on the right. Okay, pause the video, and after you've read the question and answer it, advance. And so you realize that the mussel population increased to the detriment and actually elimination of all the other species. And so with this, hopefully you have a good 
background into ecosystems and will be ready to go forward and do the homework and the lab. Let me know through email or Sally if you have any questions.